Okay, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, because I don't know when will you visit this video presentation. And uh, I would just like to congratulate, congratulate each one of you for reaching this part of your academic endeavor. Okay, so here we go. So we are now moving to module two, which is entitled Poetry in Archipelago or Poetry of the Archipelago. So I'm back. Hello, I'm back. So on poetry writing. So according to our book, poetry is probably the most sophisticated of all literary genre. Okay, when we say sophisticated, it has many rules to follow. It has uh, intricate and uh, substantial structure. That's why we said sophisticated. And it is one of a kind when you really compose or create a poem. So epics, Proverbs, riddles, and fox songs during the early times, they are in poetic form. So we have studied that in the pre-colonial, in the topic about pre-colonial literature. And so this epics, proverbs, riddles, and fox songs are in poetic form, wherein it is with a specific or formal scheme in which they strictly follow. Okay. We have here name Hemino Abad, which is who is a writer and a literary critic. And he has written that the journey to creating a local poetic identity has been continually transformed by the different colonizers who have stayed in the country and the continued fascination of the languages, be it English, Filipino, and et cetera. So we believe that when the colonizers came to our country, so they contributed something when it comes to our understanding of literature. So, so what does poetry offer? So poetry is still the chosen genre of many local writers. For it offers a uniqueness that other genres may not achieve. And this is what the opportunity to see the world anew with every single written word. Because if we will compare poetry to any kind of literature, so it is really sophisticated because words should be chosen enough, okay? So it is the opportunity once again to see the world anew with every single written word. That's what poetry offers, especially to the readers. So poems, of course, in its structure, we have stanza, and verses. So verses are also lines in the poem. Comes from Latin word versus, same thing as sparrows. So that is mainly the structure of a traditional poem. So we're now deal on Philippine poetry. So in 90s, it says there that Filipino poetry celebrated romanticism because there is the birth of several poems about loved flourish. Because when we talk about romanticism, it is more on loved okay? affairs about love and theme about loved. Okay, so several poems about love flourished. And eventually as the years went on, poetry became more formalists. Okay, so formalists would mean it is the emphasis, the emphasis is more on the form 
and language the poet to use rather than the theme itself. So in the first one, in Romanticism, it is mainly focused on the theme, which is about love. While in Formalist, from the word alone form, so it is more focused on the form and the language itself. And then here comes the modern poetry. So in modern poetry, writers are, because writers are more adventurous in their craft. So they want to go out from the traditional way of making poems. That's why we call it modern poetry because they wanted to discover, okay, discover other at the, uh, other we call it structure or other things on how they present or make poems. And let's now proceed to the elements of poetry, which is suggested by local writers. When you say local writers, uh, these are the, like for example, here in the Philippines, they are Filipinos. Okay, the first one is census and images. So this is census and images are used to describe their impression about a topic or object of writing. Next one. That is why the writer uses carefully chosen words and phrase words to create an imagery that the reader can see through his or her senses. So from the word alone, senses and images. So this is being brought by their, their observation about the things around them. We have also the category of the kinds of sense impression. Okay. Number one is visual imagery. So what comes first to your mind when we talk about visual? So it's a visual vision. So it talks about the things we see. That's why in visual imagery, it is the writer, what the writer wants you to see. Okay. That's in visual imagery. Like for example, he, he enumerated there things like colorful, so it means that what are the colorful things that we could, we could see around us? So it may be crayons, it may be the rainbow, it may be flowers because, because they have varied colors. Okay, so what the author or the writer wants you to see, that's in visual imagery. The next one is olfactory. So this is a bit of a biology class, olfactory. So what the writer wants you to hear. Like for example, choo choo, something like that. So that is in written form. So you have already the idea that that is a train, right? Because that is what the writer wants you to hear. So by the sound alone, you have already the idea of what the writer or the poet wants you to hear. Okay, how about gustatory? So gustatory would mean what the writer wants you to taste. Okay, like for example, it's yummy, it's, it's crispy, it's juicelicious, something like that. Here in the Philippines, we, we, we know that already and that is Jollibee, something like that. I'm not promoting Jollibee, so it's just an example. Okay, how about when you, the crisp, uh, what else? So for color, it should be green. It, it is crisp and uh, it has a sour taste. Okay, so we, we have already the idea that there is a mango, a mango or fruit. Okay, how about tactile? So it is the, what the author wants you or wants us to feel. Like for example, he present or he or she presented there soft, light, and comforting. 
So it will sound like uh, maybe it's it's a feather, okay? Because it's soft, light. Could also be cotton, okay? Something like that. So tactile means what the author wants you to feel. And for auditory, of course, I know that you have already an idea there. So it, it is what the author wants you to. Oh, I'm so sorry with olfactory. Olfactory, what the writer wants you to smell. Okay, I'm so sorry for that. So auditory is what the author wants you to hear. Okay, olfactory, I'll repeat what the writer wants you to smell. Okay, so auditory, like the choo-choo a while back. So you have already the idea that it is a train. So that those are, or these are the categories of the kinds of sense impression. Okay, the next element of poetry for local writers is the, what we call diction. So diction is what? So it, this is another important element in Filipino poetry. And in fact, Filipino writers are very careful of the way they write and the words they use to form their poems. Okay. So diction is the denotative and connotative meaning of the words in a sentence a phrase or paragraph or a poem. You when say denotative meaning, it's the dictionary meaning, okay? Or the usual meaning that we could uh, see when we research in the internet or in the Webster dictionary. When we say connotative, it is the implied meaning or the figurative meaning of a word. Okay, like for example, when we say snake, okay? So the denotative for a snake is it's part of the reptile family so that, because that is it's real, the real meaning of a snake. But for connotative, it can be your enemy or it can be like in in the book of Genesis, right? It can be sin. It can be, what do you call that? Mm. Temptation, something like that. Okay. And for friends, it can be the back, the, the one who will backstab you. <laughs> okay, something like that. So that's the connotative meaning of the word snake. That's why when they call you a snake, oh, you better think twice. And I'm very sure that you will not accept that fact, right? Okay, the next one is the rhyme scheme. The rhyme scheme would mean it's the way the author arranges words, meters, lines, and stanzas to create coherent sound. Okay, when you say coherent sound, it's good to hear. It, there is unity. So we acquire coherent sound when, of course, when the poem is read out loud. It may be formal or informal, depending on the way the poem was written by the poet. So by the structure alone or the rhyme scheme, we have already the idea if the poem is informal or formal or in its formal form. That's why senses, images, diction, and rhyme scheme, so these are emphasized in this canonical poem, Gabu. So Gabu, this, the poem is about a coastline in Ilocos that has been weathered away by the battering of the restless sea. So the person of the poem is able to relate it with one situation in life. And actually the last line of it is, it is the sea versus a habit of shore. And I want to present to you, to you the whole poem. And it go, uh, but before that, let me introduce 
to you the background of the author. So, okay, it should be Carlos Angeles. Okay, Carlos Angeles was born on May 25, 1921 in Tacloban, Leyte. He had also finished his undergraduate degree in the University of the Philippines. His works are included also in poetry anthologies in the United States of America. And his poetry collection is Ton of Jewels, won the Don Carlos Palanca Memorial Awards in poetry. So his poem, Gabu, is said to be one of the most widely read and well-loved Filipino poems written in English. Okay, so if you have the time, so of course, even though you don't have time, but when you view this video presentation, so you have already the idea of what Gabu is. So I think that you are ready now to hear the narration of the poem Gabu. Okay, Gabu by Carlos Angeles. The battering restlessness of the sea. I want you to imagine what is happening. Insists a tidal fury upon the beach. At Gabu and its pure consistency, havocs the wasteland hard within its reach. Brutal the day long bashing of its heart against the seascape where for mice around farther than sight itself, the rock stones part and drop into the elemental wound. The waste of centuries is gray and dead and neutral where the sea has beached its brine, where the spil split salt of its heart lies spread among the dark habiliments of time, the splendor misses for here at Gabu where the ageless tide recurs all things forfeited are most loved and dear. It is the sea pursues a habit of shores. So I just want to share what I have learned from this poem. Okay, so I'll be focusing on the last part of the poem. Okay, the the line that was being the patch from the whole thing. So I think this is already the conclusion because it says here that it is the sea pursues a habit of shores. So just try to imagine that the sea is, are, or the sea is, okay, the sea will be the people, okay, people like you and me, okay. So the habit of shores just try to imagine also that those are your dreams, aspirations, goals in life, okay? So of course, every day we are combating how to reach those goals, how to attain those goals in our lives. So we are like the sea, okay? We try, we try hard to really reach that far or strategize how we reach our goals in life, okay? And the one thing that is worth pursuing that I could suggest is heaven, okay? Because what's the use of uh, our religion, Christianity, okay? If we will not believe that, Jesus Christ will come for the second time. Okay, so that is the, our main goal here on earth because we are just journeying here on earth. And what we are really aiming for is the heavenly home God is preparing for each one of us. So that's the deeper meaning of Gabu for me. Okay, so that's Gabu.
Okay, another element that we could uh, add to that is the speaker. So speaker in a poem. So it is the voice that talks to the reader. Sometimes refer to itself, we use the pronoun I or me, and sometimes in the third person, he, she, his, or her, and is not necessarily the poet. So that's the, per, that's the speaker. Actually, we call that, we call the speaker in uh, poetry as the person. The next element as well to, to add is the structure. So structure would mean the arrangement of words and lines either together or apart. So we have seen in the Gabu as an example, the last line was a bit apart from the content okay, because that is, that's the author. That is the main thing the author wants you to, to see and observe. And that serves as the conclusion part or the concluding part of the, of the given poem Gabu. Structure also refers to the way the interdependent parts of it are organized to, for, to form a whole form. Okay, when you say the interdependent parts, okay, could be the, the senses and images, the rhyme scheme, the structure, the persona or the, the characters. It could also be the diction. So these are the interdependent parts. So it is how the persona or the writer or the poet arrange well to come up with good poem or reading material. Okay, we have also the word order. So word order would mean either the natural or a natural arrangement of words in a poem. That's why we have this term, which is called poetic license, which is the poet may invent words. So maybe your question, why invent words? So it is also the used, so poetic license, one, one factor is that it is also the use of local words which do not have English translations, okay? That's why we use the word poetic license. Okay. So Filipino poetry, although greatly influenced by the previous colonizers of the country, stands on its own when it comes to its unique elements. So there is a certain voice that Filipino poetry offers. That is one which a fellow Filipino like you can relate to, especially when you apply this in real life situations. I'll repeat. So this is the voice that is being offered by Filipino poetry. And it is the one which a fellow Filipino like you can relate to, especially when you apply this in real life situations. So like for example, when Filipino authors will write, their main target should be Filipino readers as well, wherein Filipinos could relate to it. For example, here in the Philippines, we have really many issues in life. And until today or un until now, we are battling against calamities, against corruption, against this COVID-19. So there are really many issues and I think we could relate all to it, to them. Okay, so that's what Filipino poetry can offer. Okay, let's now proceed to close reading of Filipino poetry. Okay, we have also this, the concept of organic unity was established by the New Criticism School of Thoth. All interdependent parts of a literal selection must add up to create one whole. That's what we call organic unity. So there should be 
the elements. Okay, like word order, like rhyme scheme, I'll repeat, like structure, like senses and images, diction, and etc. So these are the interdependent, interdependent parts. So when you have it all in your poem, then you have this organic unity. So to understand the organic unity of a poem, okay, we will be using the process of close reading. So what is close reading? So close reading, it is a way to analyze the poem by carefully reading and rereading a text until you have found its interpretation. So it's not only one time reading, but it's also, it means many times okay, because of the word rereading a text until what you found, you find its interpretation. So what to look for in close reading? Maybe you're questioning how to do close reading. So the first one that you may look for is the context of the poem. So the context of the poem would mean when it was written, so the date, the setting in which it was written, the place, the reason why it was written. Okay, the main reason or the cause. So for you to better understand its idea, the next thing to do when you close read is you look for the interdependent elements. Okay, you know already that. Okay, next one is, okay, so you look for interdependent elements because you want to find visual clues to its meaning through its rhyming scheme, overall structure, word order and the like. Okay, you may also want to try to identify who the persona is and who the persona is dedicating the poem to. Okay. Again, the persona does not necessarily have to be the author. It can be any face in local society. Someone who fits the description in the poem quite well. Okay, let us try to close read the poem, which is entitled, Is It the Kingfisher by Marjorie Abasco. But before that, I want to introduce to you the author of the poem. Okay. It is by the name Marjorie Abasco, who was born on September 21, 1953 in Bohol. So she writes bilingually, means she could write two languages or two dialects specifically English and Cebuano Visayan. She's also considered one of the country's earliest feminist poets. When you say feminist, um, more of, he, of her writings talk about femin, uh, female or the female or women empowerment. And in 2010, she received the prestigious Southeast Asian Right Award or the C Right. And currently a professor emeritus of De La Salle University, Malila. When we say professor emeritus, okay, she had already, uh, what do you call that? She's already done with her service or retired, but she wanted to come back and teaching in her teaching profession. That's why we call them as Professor Emeritus. So I'll try to read it for with to you. The poem is it the Kingfisher by Marjorie Abasco, and you try also to imagine what is happening in this. Poem. This is how I desire God on this island with you today basic and blue, as the sea that softens our feet with salt and brings the living wave to our mouths. Playing with sounds of a primary language, God is blue, sang the poet Juan Ramon Jimenez, drunk with desiring, his hair, eyebrows, eyelashes, turned blue as the kingfisher's wings. It is this bird that greets us as we come round the eastern bend of this island. 
tells us the hairbreadth boundary between us is transient in the air, permeable to the blue. Of tropic skies and mountain gentian, where we sit on this rock covered with seaweeds, I suddenly feel the blueness embrace us. This rock, this island, <coughs> this change air, the distance between us and the self, we have longed to be. A bolt of burning blue lights in my brain, gives the answer we pursued this whole day. Sea waves sing it, the kingfisher flies in it. This island is rooted in it, desiring God is transparent blue, the color which makes our souls visible. So if you want to close with the given poem, so you should do the re-reading, okay? But of course, I will already elaborate what is in the poem, Is It the Kingfisher? Okay. So Is It the Kingfisher by Marjorie Evasco. So it analyzes the relationship one has with the supreme being. Okay. So you should read and reread such poem by Evasco to close read the poem. So I have a question here. So how do we strengthen our relationship to our almighty God? Okay, I would suggest first, you should have your devotional every morning. You should have your devotional every morning. Okay, by reading the Bible or a devotional book. Next, you should pray. Uh, next, you should attend the church services. Okay, and you could also experience uh, nature, the nature you, you can visit and experience nature walk along the beach or in the forest or anywhere. Okay, and that's how you will know that there is really a creator. Okay, I think that's the end of my presentation. And if you have concerns regarding this video presentation, so it's just a one click away. So please PM me or DM me so that your concern will be answered. Okay, so thank you so much for listening and I hope that you, are, you have a great, great day. You are experiencing a good day and a great day today. So see you on my next video presentation. Goodbye and be blessed.